I spent the last six months living inside an abandoned RV. This was not by choice. I spent a long time thinking about the word this. As time's gone on, it's becoming clear to me that I should be honest about my mistakes, although I have no desire to give my identity away. Still, I can't just stay silent. So, should I start this like a talk at a conference? Should I slowly work my way to some massive justification for my life's work? I could tell you how my work could potentially have offered new ways to deliver complex medicines or offered philosophical insights into the past and future of life's organization or even created blueprints for strange new robotics that would let mankind conquer the stars. Or maybe perhaps I should actually be honest. I studied slime molds, and I did it because I liked feeling like the smartest person in the room, so I picked a topic few people could challenge me on. The problem was that I was very impressive to most lay people, but within my field I wasn't particularly well recognized. I dealt with taxonomic classification and was, for all intents and purposes, a lab assistant. Our field team collected lots of samples, and someone had to organize them, categorizing the molds and ordering them, looking for anything that stands out. I've joked that I've discovered more species than any other scientist. I just never got the credit. That might actually be true. But it's also true that I spent almost all my time running through a fixed battery of tests. Researchers sent me dirt. I developed cultures, tested them, and if anything was unusual, I would send it off to a genetics lab for testing. Any papers that got published would have me listed as an author, usually sixth or seventh. I was forever lost in the E to L, but for almost 99% of the time, the test came back with the same old results. Somewhere above me were other, more celebrated scientists who were looking for novel species that might do strange new things. That's where the robotics and medicine stuff comes from, of course. Don't forget, penicillin was a mole, just like the things I look at. But I wasn't saving the world. I was doing the same old shit day in and day out. Mine was the boring work that needed doing to save other people time and money, while I jealously waited for a chance to prove myself to the older academics. That chance, I thought, came with Melissa. It started with a small sample of mold sent to me along with hundreds of others, one I would later come to name Melissa after my late sister, whose favorite color was turquoise. To this day, I don't know exactly where Melissa came from, just that the note on her file seemed like a joke to me, so I ignored it. Researchers occasionally slipped references into the notes for a bit of fun. Either way... Melissa was one of many strange, unidentified organisms who we share this world with, picked out of some dark, forgotten corner where she had been overlooked, and then shepherded to my small basement, level laboratory. She was a shimmering, almost metallic beauty, with vivid, pulsing veins spread along her pastel cloudy hues. She looked like a psychedelic explosion caught in time and staring at her microscopic structure felt like being transported to an alien world. Even at first glance I knew she was going to be special. And oh boy was she starting with the fact she never got a single maze wrong. She could home in food with remarkable accuracy, the kind you might expect from an actual organism. After about 50 trials, I was getting ready to write up the unusual nature of Melissa's success, when I noticed the sample in the maze had what appeared to be some kind of dirt in it. A closer look showed a tiny black orb the size of a salt grain embedded in her bluish flesh. They reminded me an awful lot of a clam's eyes and acting on a hunch, I decided to play some card that obscured the location of the nutrient packet and then run a few more trials. I remember thinking it was such a stupid idea. If anyone had asked why I'd done it, I would have struggled to come up with a sane idea. Eyes are multicellular and complex. Slime molds are simple. That kind of specialization just doesn't exist in their kingdom, even in the more complex fungi. 
but Melissa was full of surprises. What she did next was quite, really quite remarkable. She simply crawled up the maze wall, regrew her eyes, for it was now clear to me that they were eyes, in a new location, and used the vantage point to identify which branch to use before solving the maze all over again. I must have repeated that experiment a hundred times, but eventually exhaustion got the better of me, and I called it a day. Before I left, I sampled Melissa to grow another dozen samples, providing them with plenty of nutrition to encourage growth. I knew that the next day I'd need to go through an awful lot of very rigorous tests, and I very much wanted to be prepared. When I returned the following morning, I was utterly enthralled to discover that Melissa's growth was successful. I now had over a dozen independent samples of her, which meant I needn't worry about working with a limited supply. Once again, I set off to work, and while I can't go into tremendous detail, I will say that Melissa was truly something special. Over time, it became obvious to me that she possessed rudimentary powers of information processing and could readily call into effect cellular specializations with as little as 60 minutes preparation. Of course, that might not sound very incredible to you, but try growing a third eye in one hour and let me know how easy you find it. And there were more than just eyes. There were special fibers, microscopically shaped like small springs that, under certain electrochemical signals, could tighten. These were no more than a few nanometers across, but in one demonstration, Melissa wove hundreds of thousands across a wall. Well, a bit of playing card, I'd sellotaped to the maze, and buckled it to clear a path to food. In another demonstration, she used specialized digestive juices to break down a plastic wall, chemically engineering the necessary enzymes to break apart the laminated business card. I had to work with very limited supplies, you see. In another set of trials performed in total darkness, she grew a myriad of tiny hairs across her surface and used them to detect faint vibrations in the air. Not only did she use this to solve the maze in record time, tracking an artificial beeping sound I used to indicate the correct path, but she later used this same trick to recognize sounds like my footprints. Pretty soon, Melissa learned to detect the correct path just by the sound of the food packet being dropped into place regardless of light conditions, so I had to create dummy packets to properly control the experiment. There was no end to her magic when I presented her with some acid-resistant plastic Tupperware to you and I. Melissa developed a series of chitinous hooks to grind and tear it apart. Of course, it took four hours, but it looked quite ferocious when sped up, like a sea of knives come to life. Fascinatingly, I also found that if I trained one sample of Melissa with half of a puzzle solution and trained another sample with the other half, that once combined the two samples would successfully integrate both halves and solve the problem completely. In fact, just a few cells from one sample transferred to another could impart significant knowledge. By the time the day ended, there must have been a large amount of knowledge spread out between the twelve samples. Melissa was a once-in-a-lifetime discovery, and I so desperately wanted her to myself. I was going to do my tests, I decided, record them appropriately, and have all the proof necessary to show everyone that I was more than just a lab monkey to be overlooked. I left work that day feeling ecstatic, barely able to contain my excitement. This was the kind of thing that would have people from every department knocking on my door. Computer scientists, neuroscientists, psychologists, mathematicians, and doctors alike would all want to work with me. I fantasized all evening about cancer, curing moles trained to detect and consume tumorous tissue, plastic-eating organisms solving world pollution, and engineered moles that could grow enough nutritious fruit to end world hunger. Unfortunately, the next day I returned to find that someone had nudged the twelve individual samples closer together, possibly looking for more room on one of the shelves in the refrigeration unit. Either way, Melissa sensed herself and reached out across the various dishes, cracking lids where necessary, and reassembled her various parts into a single sample. 
It was no larger than a dinner plate by the time, but it meant none of my individual samples could be tracked. Any hope of continuing specific experiments from the before were dashed, and I had to resolve to start all over again. Or at least that was my intention. Unfortunately, some of the tricks Melissa had learned were quite vivacious. Initially, I tried lifting her with my latex-gloved hands, but soon felt a prick as I slid my finger between the glass shelf and her cold flesh. Pulling my hand away, I noticed a small needle-like protuberance embedded in my flesh. It was hardly deadly, but afterwards I found myself feeling trepidation at the thought of touching her again. I'd never been stung before, and certainly never by my own work. Still, a nearby spatula let me pry her away, and I quickly set to work with some knives. I'll admit to feeling a bit reprehensible as I watched Melissa struggle. First, she oozed thick acid to try and melt the knife, but that was futile. She tried fixing some of her microscopic filaments to my skin and the handle, perhaps to gain some leverage, but she was far too slow, and they snapped pitifully as I sawed away. I watched as her flat, glistening form rippled in display threats, and also saw strange patterns of hooked flesh that looked much like the inside of a shark's mouth rise and clash against the cold steel to no effect. Eventually, and this was the part I found hardest to deal with, Melissa stopped her attacks and grew even more primitive black eyes and furry patches of ear to watch her own mutilation. And, of course, to watch me. She never flinched, though, not even after I'd separated her into dozens of pieces that, sadly, never stopped trying to reach each other. After that, she became non-compliant. She stopped trying to solve the maze and instead focused solely on me. The only instance of activity I ever saw was when I dropped a small paper clip on the testing area and Melissa assimilated it before I had chance to reach it. I tried pinching it out as she sucked it into her pliable body, but succeeded only in getting stung once more, this time by a far longer and slightly curved proboscis that javelined out towards my hand by a good five or six inches. I laughed at the time, amazed at how there was no end to her marvelous abilities, and simply accepted the loss of stationery. But afterwards, I found myself increasingly disappointed with just how difficult it was to get any work done with such a hostile subject. That was a disappointing day. There was no testing or growth of any kind. Just me bumbling about as I presented novel stimuli in the hope of eliciting new behaviors. By the time that day ended, I wondered if Melissa had learned as much about me as I had about her, and I sullenly returned the various Petri dishes back to the fridge. That later turned out to be a mistake. The fridge was filled with over a hundred other samples, and I returned the following day to find them destroyed. Not only was this a grotesque loss of over three months' worth of my academic work, but it appeared that Melissa had absorbed precious specimens and contaminated herself along the way. Strange fibrous protrusions crossed various shelves, and Melissa, now significantly larger than before, was slowly turning every other sample around her, a glistening iridescent shade of turquoise. I decided that I would no longer be able to do this on my own. Melissa was simply too tenacious, and the stress was already robbing me of sleep. I'd barely been in the lab for an hour, and already I could feel a headache coming on. The stress and excitement were getting to me, so decided to bring in a colleague to cover for me while I rested. If anything, it'd be good for them to confirm my prior findings. I reached out to a good friend whose identity I can no more share than my own, who arrived at my door only a few minutes later. They looked awfully concerned as I sat and explained. Each and every one of my experiments to them. The poor man was obviously incredulous at my claims, but by this point I was so exhausted and my nose so blocked and my stomach so sore that I had no desire to argue with him. Look, I said, the sample is in there, and it speaks for itself. Just take a look while I catch up on some sleep, and then you can apologize at not trusting me. He laughed at that and let me go on my way, probably because I was so clearly tired and disheveled that he felt the need to humor me. 
I might have been surprised at how bad I felt at the time, but I've long since been familiar with just how bad sleeplessness and exhaustion can affect the mind and body. Old cuts don't heal. Slight infections grow aggressive. Colds are prolonged, headaches more severe. Even as I collapsed onto the cot, I took a moment to consider just how badly swollen Melissa's stings were. They throbbed and ached, stinking of infection, and I decided I'd need a course of antibiotics if they showed no sign of healing by the time I woke up. Then, with blurry vision and a pulsing headache, I quickly drifted off to thoughts of noble prizes. For the first time in two nights... I found myself dreaming. They were profoundly unusual dreams, even for someone who studies slime molds all day, looking much like beautiful fractal patterns and brightly colored shimmering flesh. It was as if someone had turned a living person into some kind of modern art, taking the vivid and rich purples of bruised flesh and the pallid sickly yellow of jaundiced skin and intertwined them, weaving a tapestry out of threaded skin and nerves. It was all a dizzying kaleidoscope of abstract sensations and images that left me feeling deeply sick, so much so that the first thing I did when I awoke was vomit into a nearby wastebasket. God, what a rancid mix that was, that which fell sloppily out of my open mouth as I shook feverishly over the bin, barely able to hold myself upright. There were visible blood vessels buried in that strange rainbow-colored spew, thick blue capillaries that shivered and moved like dying fish. I decided in that moment that I desperately needed to visit the doctor and went to tell my colleague about my need to leave works. Smiling to myself that I'd also get to hear him tell me I was right about the miracle mold, only to be confused when I saw him lying on the floor through the glass partition. Somehow, and I'm still not sure how, my friend must have slipped during the testing. On the countertop was a slick pool of blood, and his head was opened from a nasty gash, just above the ear quite likely from where he struck the counter as he fell, panicking. I pushed open the door and pulled my phone out, ready to call emergency services. But after looking up, I was forced to stop after only a few steps. The lower half of my friend was covered in the bumpy, irregular shape of Melissa, whose slimy and embrace had inched its way up his legs, like he was a fallen tree waiting to be digested. My God! I cried out and ran forward. Starting at the sound, my friend opened his eyes and looked at me in a daze, most likely unaware of what was happening. Don't worry, Harold, I cried. I'll get it off. I reached forward and grabbed a thick lump of Melissa. She was now easily a meter, squared in size and as thick as a deck of playing cards. But I instantly felt a terrible pain shooting up my arm. Good God, it hurt. It hurt worse than anything I've ever felt, like a hundred thousand tiny burns. Immediately, blood flowed out from under my gloves, and I tore my hand away with a terrible sound, not unlike Velcro straps being pulled apart. What was left of my skin looked like a fleshy cicatrix, and under other circumstances, I might have fainted out of sheer pain but my screaming had awakened something in Melissa, and she reared herself upwards like tsunami and revealed a terrible sight. There was barely anything left of my friend below the waist. She had dissolved muscle and skin, leaving only softening bone and a yellowish stew that gurgled audibly. I looked back at my friend with new horror. He shouldn't have been alive. Slowly his mouth opened, and he rasped without moving his lips. Help! In a voice that wasn't his. Get away! I screamed, and suddenly his torso lunged at me. It filled me with terror, the way he moved like a tongue to Melissa's lips, hungrily searching for me. It was almost like a punch in Judy Doll, his body visible only from the waist up, the puppeteer hidden by the curtain of rippling mold that coated his legs. I easily kicked his hands away from my legs, and just as quickly as I had entered, I fled the lab and slammed the door shut behind me, pressing my back up against it, forcing it shut. I took a moment to catch my breath, jumping momentarily when the door jostled from Melissa. 
She could sense me beyond, and slowly a shadow was cast across the room from behind me as she slithered up the glass in search of my flesh. I turned and saw an enormous writhing mess of cilia in gaping sphincters that winked aggressively, sometimes bearing teeth, hungrily pressing against the glass like a starfish at an aquarium. Then came a familiar hissing as digestive juices began to break down the door in its wooden frame. Quickly I stepped away, just in time to avoid a dozen spindly spider-like legs flicker under the gap towards my heels. It was clear to me now that I had grossly underestimated Melissa. I could no longer act like she was anything but a direct and immediate threat to my life, so I decided to go for the simplest solution of all. I lit the room on fire, starting with the door she was trying to break apart. Thankfully, there were lots of dangerous chemicals on hand, and they all burned very, very hot. It was actually quite odd watching her react to that ancient threat. Melissa quickly realized that the only exit was blocked by the flames, and many of our laboratories are designed to be controlled environments with very little risk of contamination, offering her few routes to leave. I could never really say if she did or didn't escape, of course. I just knew I needed to aggressively stop her getting through. I also decided that perhaps my best chance was to disappear, maybe even hope that the half-eaten remains of my charred colleague might be mistaken for my own body. That's not to say I had a clear plan in my head as I fled the lab in university, rather just some kind of peculiar instinctual desire to flee, which I did in a desperate and haphazard manner. I left my whole life behind that day, driven by some overwhelming compulsion to get the hell away from that room. In some ways, it was almost like my mind wasn't my own. It has since become clear to me just how stupid I was. I had been forced to live in this wretched, broken-down caravan, far away on a Hebridean Isle somewhere in the North Sea. I'm not even entirely sure what's left of Melissa or where she went after the fire. Sometimes I have apocalyptic nightmares of her slowly digesting the whole world, but I often remind myself that she was, after all, a natural species found on this earth. For all I know, she just returned to wherever she came from, some obscure pit or dark underground chasm, perhaps. Or perhaps she found the perfect place to hide already. Maybe she's like me, a scientist interested in exploration, in which case she's found herself quite the playground. What things will she learn there, I wonder? If only it didn't have to be so painful. It was only recently that I awoke and went to touch my feverish head, wiping away the sweat, but I was startled to find that what touched my moist skin was not my hand at all. It felt like an awful lot, like a sock. I forced my eyes open and I saw that a thick teal velvet glove had somehow been placed on my hand. I tried quickly to peel it off like it was a glove, but my thumb sank into the flesh below like I'd grabbed a piece of rotten fruit. Slowly the horror dawned on me, and I tentatively reached forward and snapped a finger off. It crumpled in my hand, effervescing powder into the still air as I crushed it in one fist. Slowly, my sanity fading, I crumbled the rest of my hand apart until I was left staring at the pulsating, hairy flesh of my exposed arm. Even the bone was soft like papier mache. Since then, it's just kept getting worse. And the dreams. Oh, God, if I could just sleep in peace, then maybe it wouldn't be so bad. Still, I do have one consolation left. At least I finally get to be part of something bigger than myself. Camped somewhere in the Kruger National Park, South Africa. Not in one of the fenced camps. We were on a five-day guided tour, driving on all the restricted roads and camping in the middle of the bush. One night I got up to take a piss outside of the tent. I walked a few meters and found a tree. Probably about 30 meters from where I stood, I saw something move and a bunch of birds took flight in that direction. Next moment, a hyena comes into view. Looking straight at me, and it started howling or laughing. It was full moon, so I got a good look. 
I could see its eyes, ears, and teeth. It was horrifying to look at this hellhound. I finished. We stared at each other, and it moved on. I wasn't sure whether I should run back to the tent or stand still and make sure it's gone. I decided to walk backward slowly. I didn't sleep well that night, considering that in that same week someone's child, camping near, not in. KNP was killed by a hyena in their tent. The reason I don't hike anymore, when I was about five or six, my father, uncle, sister, and two cousins went for a hike in Allegheny State Park, Three Sisters Trail. Of course, we ended up getting lost. Now, as a kid, I had major anxiety issues, so this was already nerve-wrenching. About 45 minutes into the hike, the sky darkened. Temp dropped severely, and the skies opened up. Torrents of rain. Hail, lightning, twenty, thirty miles per hour winds, trees falling in the woods around us. It was so loud and chaotic, I was absolutely convinced we were going to die. Turns out a small tornado touched down a few miles away, and we were in the outer radius of the storm. I've had several, but the one that scared me the most happened when I was a kid. There was a railroad track behind our house, a small patch of woods, then a road with a larger patch of woods on the other side. Anyway, I used to go out and play in the smaller patch of woods by myself, and nobody else ever went out there. Not other kids, nobody. It was like my little sanctuary where I could get away for a while and escape. One day I was sitting on this little hill just daydreaming when I heard something moving through the woods to my left. It sounded like a person, but like someone who was trying to walk quietly. I had a strong feeling someone was trying to sneak up on me, so I slowly stood up and looked off to my left to get a better view. Sure enough, a man was walking through the woods toward me, and I noticed that he was stopped, like he was trying to make as little noise as possible. Well, I was a kid and could run fast, so I got out of there quick and was practically in my backyard before he could take another step. I can still remember he was an older man wearing a blue windbreaker, and I had a strong feeling that he had seen me in the woods before, maybe when driving down the road or walking on the track. I still think he had gone in the woods that day to try to track me down and had very bad intentions. If he would have caught me, I never mentioned it to my parents or anything, but uh, I just had. A strong gut feeling that I narrowly escaped a bad situation that day. Once we were camping when I was a kid, and my parents, for some unknown reason, brought my grandmother. She was a woman of foul disposition, chronic, alcoholic, and chain-smoked Marlboros. Somehow my mom convinced her to go on a short hike with us. We went around the bend to meet a down tree and two hikers down the trail, yelling and waving us away. My grandmother ignored them completely and started to forage her way over the down tree in a plume of smoke from the Marlboro dangling from her mouth. That was when we saw the cougar under the tree, but grandmother plowed forward when she got over the tree. The cougar swiped at her leg, luckily just grazing her. She didn't flinch, took a long drag off her cigarette, and proceeded to kick the cougar square in the nose. This was not an old lady kick. She looked like an NFO punter. When her foot connected with the nose, it sounded like someone had stepped on a squeaky toy, and the cougar wisely fled back into the forest. Just found your YouTube channel and listened with interest. The story on Ben McTuey and the feeling of a spectral being. I had exactly the same on that mountain 23 years ago. I was walking or mountain biking with a friend in Scotland and decided to park at Kiosh Water and cycle or climb up to the cairn on Ben McTuey. It was a bright May day when we left on mountain bikes to go to the tops. At that point we had no idea that day would leave a lasting impression on me. And until I came across your site, 
I thought we were the only ones to have had such an encounter. It took some hours crossing small streams and hillocks before we came to the foothills of Ben McDuy. We cycled and pushed the bikes as far up the mountain as we could, and then decided to leave the bikes and make our way up to the cairn as quickly as possible as it was quite late in the day. We pushed on up in glorious weather. It wasn't bright sunlight, but it also wasn't murky, dismal, or really overcast. It was extremely cold, but we were wrapped up warm. The views were fantastic. On reaching the cairn, we decided to have a small snack to aid our return journey, and whilst we sat at the cairn, I heard a call and looked over to see a golden eagle performing twists and turns. It was everything you could ever want to see in Scotland, beautiful views from the top, and a golden eagle, more than we could ever have wished for. We were ecstatic and on a high. Finishing our snack of Mars bars and bananas, we decided to get ready for the hike back to the bikes and the long journey back to the car. It was here that the atmosphere changed, and not for the better. From being on high, all of a sudden we'd be aware of a heavy atmosphere that had descended upon us for no disconcerted reason. We turned for home and started to walk, and I had the uncanny feeling something was following us. It was a feeling of real dread. I kept looking behind me, but there was nothing there. At the same time, I heard footsteps following us, keeping just behind me. We walked a little faster, and then I stopped suddenly, and lo and behold, there came from nowhere two distinct footsteps that stopped directly behind me. I was too terrified to look, as I had an uncanny feeling that whatever was causing this feeling was huge. I cannot explain why I had the mental impression that this entity was a giant. Now this will sound silly, but I had the impression of a giant ape-like man. I am not saying Bigfoot, Alma, or Sasquatch, but that was the impression I was given. At this point, I took off with my friend at a rate of knots that was dangerous to do because of the shale underfoot. But we didn't care the faster we ran, the more the feeling of dread came over us, as if it was giving chase. It wasn't until we reached the bikes and rode off that the feeling started to dissipate. I was physically shaking and had no wish to ever return to that mountain. Thanks to your sight, I now know after all these years I wasn't going mad. Thank goodness. It was 1969. I was on patrol one evening just before dark in the North Two Corps in North Vietnam. We were returning to the hill when we encountered hostile fire. The squad was caught off guard, so we used what cover was available. The fight had been going on for only a few minutes when movement caught my eye. Through the thick vegetation, I saw what I thought was a large man breaking cover from behind my left side. As the thing ran past me, I realized it wasn't a man, and was not really sure of what I was seeing. The thing was about seven feet tall and had an enormous build, though not completely covered with hair. The thing had reddish-brown hair covering a good portion of its body. It had covered about 30 yards very quickly passing within just yards of my position. When it got hit in the crossfire, the thing stumbled once or twice but never fell. All of a sudden, the enemy broke and ran. One even left his weapon behind. They were yelling something, but none of us ever knew what it was they were yelling. We slowly regrouped and made sure no one was wounded and discussed what we thought we had seen. As it was getting dark and there were hostiles in the area, we decided to get back to the hill. That night we heard several howls sounding very similar to the ones that you have recorded coming from all over the place. Some sounded like they were just outside of the hooch and others sounded more than a mile away. They were all kinds of sounds, from whines to growls to sounds that sounded like barks. Needless to say, no one slept very well that night. The next morning, all of us that were on that patrol decided to try to track this thing. It took a lot of talking to get tops to let us go looking for it, but after hearing the same story from the whole squad, he decided to let us have a chance to bring it back. We returned to the area and found a blood trail leading into the jungle. We trailed it for quite some time when we found the body of an enemy soldier that had been almost entirely torn apart. 
We do not know exactly what happened, but I have a good notion to what may have happened. We basically ran out of the area back to our hill. The rest of the time we were in Vietnam. I never heard the sounds or saw anything like it again. The talk of what we had seen spread very quickly, and some of the locals called it a name that I can neither pronounce nor remember, but the translation, if I recall, was stench monkey or fowl. Monkey, something like that. I can't remember for sure. What I do know is that it bothered me so much that I transferred from there to a job on a helicopter so that I wouldn't have to be in the jungle anymore. After returning home to Alabama when my tour had ended, I occasionally heard sounds that reminded me so much of that encounter. It had been years since I left Alabama and moved to West Central Illinois. I seldom thought of that day in Vietnam or the things I heard and saw. The recording is exactly what I had heard over there. I could close my eyes and still hear the howl in Vietnam. Regrettably, I have mixed feelings about discovering your website. Relieved that someone else may now know what I went through. Frightened that I add that there may be something in the area of where I now live. I realize that you are interested in pursuing this creature or one like it, but let me warn you from someone who has seen what it is capable of firsthand. Don't! First, I want you to know that the story I'm going to share with you is 100% true. It is based on my account of an event that has significantly impacted the way I view the world around me. As humans, we take comfort in the known and are often fearful or skeptical of phenomenon or entities that we don't understand. Of course, there's many people out there, myself included, who thoroughly enjoy questioning subjects beyond human comprehension. But alas, we are a minority, often lumped into a cynical category of conspiracy nut jobs. I'm not writing this story to change what you believe, but rather to share with you what I now know to be truth. I have followed countless subreddits over the past few years, but this is my first time making an account specifically for the purpose of posting this story. Disregard the silly account name. My sense of humor will surely be my end of days. For now, let us acquaint ourselves with the eager experience that dwells within me, yearning at its chance to finally be known by unfamiliar souls. I am the oldest of two children in a family of four. As I write this, my mother and father are both 50, my younger sister 20, and myself 23. My father recently retired from 29 years of military service in the United States Army. Naturally, as is common in military families, I've seen my fair share of the world. We've been stationed everywhere from Georgia and Italy to Washington and Texas. Although I was born in Hawaii and am currently living there again, I always consider Washington State to be the place where I really grew up, so to speak. I lived there from 5th grade to 11th grade, years that were crucial in my transition from boy to man. The Pacific Northwest, as stunningly beautiful as any place on earth could possibly be, brought with it its fair share of curiosities. Many of you might know that the area is particularly famous for UFO sightings and Bigfoot sightings. Being the young child that I was upon my arrival, I took an interest in the unknown. Every week I was at the library with my mom, renting books about alien abductions, ghosts, Yiddish, Bigfoot, UFOs, crop circles, the Bermuda Triangle, demonic possession, and a myriad of other phenomena that commanded my attention. I include this information because it will be critical to the story later on. I will say for now that from my readings, I was pretty knowledgeable of what Bigfoot evidence consisted of. I had read many stories and reports of the infamous stench they carry, the loud shrieking cries they make, and many other signs of their presence. It is because of this beforehand knowledge that I remember some of the small details of my account. Had I not understood the traits that people have attributed to Bigfoot, many of the small details in my account would probably have slipped through the cracks. Now let us visit the day of, the event, that day, that day. I have kept quiet of for far too long. 
I was 13 years old at the time and in the seventh grade, so that puts us back in the year 2005. The spring season was coming to an end around this time, and in Washington, spring and summer are the only times one gets to enjoy the sun. Throughout fall and winter, it's pretty much just heavy rain, day in and day out. Summers were notorious for thunderstorms, though. It wasn't uncommon to wake up drenched in sweat and go to bed drenched in rain. Weather patterns in Washington State are the very definition of unpredictable. On this particular summer day, it was Saturday, and my father and I decided to go fishing. We usually go fishing twice a month, and we usually go to the same spot to do so, a massive lake surrounded by dense forestry, located only a few miles away from an Indian reservation. It was a beautiful lake, and we loved being surrounded by all the trees and wildlife with no cities or major roads nearby. It made for nice, peaceful bonding experiences with my father. He had just returned from his first 365-day deployment to Iraq, so I was eager to finally spend a day with my old man again. The lake itself was surrounded by forest, with a region to the west running out into the Pacific Ocean or Puget Sound. The region to the north led to the Indian Reservation. To the east was a small town primarily consisting of Native Americans, many of them from the reservation had set up shops in this nearby town. Into the south was the interstate that took you back to, well, civilization. With the exception of the occasional fellow fishermen strolling by, the lake was always desolate and eerily silent. After arriving to our usual fishing hole and unloading all of the poles, lures, and tackle boxes from the back of the Toyota pickup truck my dad drove, I don't remember the model or year. Everything was business as usual. The sun was out. It was about 1 p.m., and my father kept sharing stories of his experiences in Iraq while I continued to eagerly beg for more. We casted our lines, exchanged words, chewed some sunflower seeds, spit out the shells, reeled in the lines, and then moved on to a different story before recasting and repeating the whole process. I loved it. It was a ritual, a ritual only he and I fully appreciated the sentimentality of. Minutes turn to hours, and before we know it, it's about 5.30 in the evening. We decide to pack it in because nightfall in that part of the state could arrive as early as 6, 6.30, and we didn't want to be in the forest at nighttime, primarily because of bears and wolves. Keep in mind, however, that it is still currently bright out and the sun has only just began to make its descent beyond the mountains. With more than enough daylight to pack up, my father starts reeling in all of the casts and breaking down the poles. I packed up the tackle boxes and lures and threw them into the pickup bed along with the coolers and snacks we had packed. The poles were the only things left to be loaded up, and then we would be ready to leave. I was about to tell my father that I was going to go take a piss real quick, and before I could even open my mouth, I caught a whiff of a smell that I can still remember clearly to this day. It was rancid. That's the best way to describe the stench. Absolutely rancid. I have never smelled anything so terrible in my life. Do you smell that? I called out. What? What? replied my father. I figured it must have just been something blowing through in the breeze. Never mind. It smelled like a wet dog rolled around in its own shit, got hit by a truck, lied dead under a hot sun for two weeks, and then burst into some kind of maggot-infested stench cloud. And that's just putting it politely. The odor stung my eyes. Dad, I'm gonna go pee real quick. I'll be back. He nodded and off I went into the shrubbery to our usual piss spot. Oftentimes we would just pee anywhere, but because we had seen a few fishermen walk by a couple hours ago, I figured it'd be safer to just go piss in the trees. We usually piss behind this massive fallen tree that's roughly 50 yards into the woods. It's leaned at a perfect angle that provides total obscurity from the lakeside. The forest itself is thick enough to probably conceal me without the aid of the fallen tree, but somehow pissing behind this tree just became habit during the many visits we... 
have made to this fishing hole in the past. As I'm pissing, the sky was suddenly enveloped in clouds in a matter of seconds. It was bizarre. There was still daylight, but it was more gray and toned down. As opposed to the sunlight you would get with a clear blue sky. It reminded me of a winter day when the sun's presence seems completely absent. Then everything happened so fast. As I'm zipping up, I hear a tremendously loud crack right behind me. I'd say about 30 yards away based on its reverb. As I'm in the middle of turning around, my face is sprinkled with the light droplets that precede a heavy thunderstorm. I scan the area where I heard the sound, but see nothing. My immediate thought was that it was an old tree branch splitting off, which is common to hear in these woods. Crack! I hear it again, closer, but from a different direction. I would be a liar if I told you my heart wasn't racing. Like a mother if at this point. I could easily have just ran back to the fishing hole, but curiosity kept my feet glued. It was like knowing what made that sound was a prerequisite to concluding our fishing trip. After about two minutes of me standing there foolishly and realizing that I'm getting drenched in the rain that is beginning to pick up, I chalk the noise up to thunder and turn around to head back to my father. Part of me was in denial, though. It wasn't a boom sound like thunder. This was a crack like something big was being snapped in half. I took about three steps in the direction of the fishing hole when I heard the most bone-chilling sound that I've ever heard to this day. Aye, aye, aye. It sounded like a cross between a man screaming on top of his lungs and, well, another man screaming on top of his lungs. I know that might seem silly, but that's really how I remember it. It sounded like two men screaming in unison with slightly different pitches in their voice. I didn't have time to think about where that dreaded noise came from. My ass was in high gear. I remember shortly after that noise from hell. I heard my father shout my name with obvious worry in his voice. I know he heard the sound as well and probably thought it was me screaming or thought it was an animal or something. As I'm sprinting to the direction of the truck and making every effort to control my body's shaking, adrenaline is a bitch. While jumping over branches and logs and maneuvering between foliage, I suddenly hear crunch, crunch. Something is walking through the woods very close to me. Dad, dad. Yeah, was all I could manage to get out in between short breaths. And holy shit, I see it. I see it. I see it. While sprinting forward, I see a dark mass in the far left of my field of vision growing. Everything was a blur. So I just assumed everything in the corner of my eyes was bushes, trees, etc. And then I realized this isn't an immobile object that's growing. This is something that's coming closer to me, getting bigger as the distance between us closes. Suddenly it hit me that this approaching object was the source of the crunch crunch. So I turned my head to the left, and what I saw accelerated me to speeds that I would think are humanly impossible. Approaching me with tremendous speed was an ape-like creature with massive swinging arms. Those I remember the most. The arms were massive and long, almost lanky in the way they dangled, but very muscular. This creature was bipedal as all hell. You know how when you go to the zoo, you see monkeys and gorillas walking around with some assistance of their forearms, kind of like tromping around on all fours, but occasionally using just two feet before leaning back onto all fours. Yeah, not this thing. This creature was full, on striding towards me with its legs, while its arms swung lazily at its sides. My biggest fear was that all it had to do was reach out to grab me because its arm seemed long enough to do that. This thing was so close to me, and all I could focus on was going faster and faster and faster. I recall the awful smell being present again. It was in full force, just the worst stench anything on this planet could produce. I was too scared to care, but I definitely remember the smell being heavy. The final details I can recall from my brief glimpse at this demon of the woodlands was that it was easily about seven, eight feet tall and matted with thick brown fur. Very long fur, too. Its head was conical in shape.
It seemed to narrow at the top, but from head to toe, this thing was matted in very long brown hair. I remember seeing bits of leaf and foliage stuck throughout the fur on its body, too. I didn't dare try and make out facial details, although sometimes I wish I had. I couldn't see much of the face from my distance combined with my constant running, and at the time I really didn't want to know what the F this thing looked like. Its body gave me more than enough fear for a lifetime. By this point, the rain is coming down heavy, and I kept telling myself in my head, Please don't slip. Please don't slip. Please don't slip. Dad! I, I must have screamed that about a thousand times. I remember making a few attempts to scream, but nothing would come out because my throat was very raw and sore from the screaming I was already doing. I also remember thinking, why does it feel like he's my dad so far away? The walk to the piss pot is a short one, and yet I swear I was running full speed for a good few minutes before I made it back. Fear does incredible things to your sense of time and space. As I approach the clearing and can make out the pickup truck by some incredible grace of parental intuition, my dad pulls some very genius shit. I'm not sure what prompted him to do this, but as I'm approaching the fishing hole, I, I see him standing by the edge of the wood line, looking for me through the foliage. His truck is already on and running, his driver's side door is open, and he's close to it, as if he knew that whatever was happening to me was going to involve a much-needed quick escape. The truck was parked in a way where the driver's side was already facing the wood line I'm running out of, so I like to think we were dealt a good hand on this day. At the very moment we made eye contact, my dad turns around and hauls ass for the driver's seat, but not before shouting, jump in the bed! Get in the back! Hurry! I should note that this is only a two-seater pickup, so my options were to circle around the truck and get in the passenger door, or to jump in the bed. It's obvious which option is far less time-consuming. Crunch, crunch, crunch. All I can think about is how happy I'm gonna be to see the interstate again. Crunch, thud, thud. This thing is still following me and is now out of the woods and running on the dirt. Its footsteps are the only indicator of its presence, while my visual focus is purely on what's ahead. I remember quickly eyeballing the best point on the ground to jump from to make it into the pickup bed smoothly. Thud, 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 and then another AI. The shriek happened just as I made my leap of faith, and I would even go as far as to say that it terrified me so much in a way that it made my jump even stronger. I jumped like my life depended on it, and no sooner than my body made contact with the bed of the truck, my dad floored it. I shifted violently around as he gunned from zero to sixty miles per hour. I couldn't feel the vicious bruise my arm had taken when I landed on one of the tackle boxes. I couldn't feel the sharp ringing in my ear from the shriek of defeat the creature emitted. I couldn't feel the sting of the two fishing hooks that burrowed just beneath the skin of my right calf. I didn't care about anything. I only cared about going home. As I gathered myself and braced myself in the bed of the truck, I looked down the rapidly vanishing dirt path we had come from and caught only a glimpse of the creature's back as it strode back into the dense foliage of the wood line. Rain was pouring down heavily, creating a light film of mist that eventually shrouded the remainder of the creature. Tall, built, hairy, and aggressive, it looked like its head was hung low, or its shoulders were slouched. Its posture didn't seem as upright as it was when it was chasing me. Whatever this thing was, it was used to having its way, and today we didn't grant him that. I remember grinning from ear to ear as we approached the first back road that led through the small town to the east. Seeing a stop sign has never made me so happy in my life. It was more than just a stop sign. It was a sign of humanity, a sign that civilization was need. During the thirty-minute drive to town, one thought kept racing through my mind. That was a friggin' Sasquatch. We stopped at a bait, 
shop in a small Native American town which consisted of a few old wooden shops and some town folk who were bringing things inside and scurrying to cover up their belongings from the rainfall. We asked the owner of the shop if he had any band-aids and a sink we could use since my leg was bleeding pretty heavily from the fish hooks. He looked like he was in his mid-thirties, very smooth complexion, dark brown skin, and a long black ponytail running down his back. He was more than happy to help us after he saw my leg. He went into the back office and returned with a wet washcloth and some gauze and was accompanied by an older man who looked like he was in his sixties with brown wrinkled skin and long gray hair, also in a ponytail. We explained the story to them while the older man was inspecting my wound, and after he removed the hooks and cleaned up the cut, he wrapped my leg firmly with gauze. Then the younger man spoke to us about how he has heard similar stories from that lake before about a large, hairy creature who lurks in the woods. None of the people in town or from the reservation ever go near the lake, according to him. It's considered cursed grounds, and he explained to us some native ancestors who were buried there for various atrocities. I don't fully remember every fine detail he told us, but he definitely said that's an area that people avoid, which would explain why it seems like nobody is ever there. He said oftentimes fishermen will come back from the lake and stop in town to get gas and share stories of seeing large beasts. While they were down there, some of them say they saw massive bears walking around like men. The older of the men asked us if we were familiar with the legend of Sasquatch, and my dad and I both said we were familiar with it, and that it was our first guess when we saw the creature. I remember the old man just nodded his head and went back into the office. Those were the only words he said. It creeped me out. It was as if he was silently confirming our suspicions. The younger man told us one last story about how there are tales that the Sasquatch causes thunderstorms. He summons rain because it somehow affects the patterns that fish appear in or something to that extent. I don't remember the specifics. But he noted that it was interesting that we were telling him the story of what just happened when a thunderstorm had just picked up. Then I recalled that when I first heard the crack while peeing, the raindrops started to pour down and eventually became a thunderstorm. It gave me chills. After my wound was taken care of, we thanked the men and left the bait shop. My dad ran into the gas station and bought two beers for us. We sat in the parked truck and each drank our beer while wholly shitting every detail of our encounter, while nightfall slowly took over for the evening. Then, after a good few minutes of speculating and thanking God that everything turned out fine, we got back on the interstate and headed home, rain coming down in sheets. We've told family and friends of our encounter, but nobody ever seems to fully understand what we went through on that summer day. How can they? It's a terror that must be felt to be understood. They didn't see what we saw, but that's okay. I wouldn't wish such a sight on my own worst enemy. I guess this experience has taught me two things. As humans, we are only a tiny speck in a world that is beyond our control. We can never truly know everything. That is out there, and to those who remain skeptical of anything deemed an imperfection in the history of mankind, I must say, such a stance demands great ignorance. Oh, and also, just piss wherever the hell you want. While at an Army military police school, my brother-in-law, Craig Miles of Boise, Idaho, met a Vietnam veteran who recalled a low-altitude Special Forces drop in the interior during 1967-68. It was the middle of the night. There were no villages for 15 miles. For a period of three nights, they heard choking and gurgling noises. On the fourth day, they found the upper half of a decomposing Bigfoot like creature. It had been blown in half by something. Not them. This was apparently not the noise they had heard. I might possibly, this was a speculation, that was circulating. They could see into the body cavity, 
spine, lungs, and such. All was crawling with bugs. There was shorter hair on the huge head. The eyes sunk back an inch and a half from the brow line. It had long arms, very large and long fingers. One hand was still wrapped around a branch. He didn't say what color it was, but did mention that it had a flat nose. If the creature had its legs, the estimated height was around eight feet tall. There was no sign of the lower half of the body. They were able to see the teeth, all flat, well, formed molars except the canines, which were longer and pointed, seemed adapted to living in the forest with long arms and fingers, or perhaps just builds night nests like gorillas sometimes do. My hiking partner and I arrived in the Kennecott area, intending to reach the campsites near the glacier. However, it started to get too dark for us, so we decided to camp at the first available site. We found a small spot right off the trail, set up camp, and hung our supplies in a tree. Down the trail, we started a fire and were just finishing a small meal when I walked to the trail to smoke. I'd been standing on the trail for a few minutes when I noticed what I thought was a person on a bike coming down the trail. I immediately let my partner know, but when I looked back, it was still in the same spot. I started looking more closely to see a face of the bike, but then I realized it was not a person. It was a large, dark form with its legs spread apart. This is what led me to think it was a person on a bike. The arms were curled at its side like someone with hands on handlebars too big for a pair, and the legs were too far apart. I called my partner, but when I turned back to look at it again, it moved very quickly into the woods on two legs. The next day we searched, but found no evidence of anything on the trail. I've told this story to a few people, but they all think I'm crazy. I hope this helps. I know what I saw, and I guess I'm just hoping somebody believes me. I'm a 24-year-old male, and I live in the middle of nowhere, literally. I'll be brief and straightforward about my encounter. I was returning home late one day after dropping my sister off at the airport in Lamar, Colorado. I live just under seven miles north of the Oklahoma border on roughly 250 acres of land. I have a trap line running around my property for coyotes. The first two traps I checked were empty, so I headed south. That's when I saw this thing. At first I thought it was a coyote, just a really big one. It was almost five feet tall and on all fours. It had gotten caught in my trap and was running around, kicking up dust. Then it suddenly stopped and looked right at me. I use a Duke number three leg hold trap so it can catch a variety of animals. Anyway, I slammed on the brakes and my truck stalled because it's a manual. I was fumbling for the keys to start it. It's an old farm truck with a carburetor and it had quite an afterfire. Once it heard that, it lunged at me and roared. I noticed that it had its hand, not a paw, but an actual hand, caught in my trap, the right hand, to be exact. It had probably been looking for the dead rabbit I had in the bait hole next to the trap. Then it stood up and ripped out the two earth anchors I had driven twenty, four inches into the ground. It had taken me a long time to put them in with a ten-pound hammer, but it pulled them straight out like it was nothing. Just fifteen seconds after that, it just stood there looking at me. It felt like an eternity, and I knew my 357 Magnum would be of no use against this thing if it came at me. I prayed to God Almighty that it wouldn't come for me in my truck. I was looking at it in shock and awe and noticed that it had orange, amber eyes. They weren't glowing, but they had a tint like a cat's eyes in the dark. They may have been reflecting my headlights. I can't be too sure. Then it took a step toward me, curled its upper lip, showing me its teeth, which were humongous, four to five inches long, easily. It growled at me and then disappeared in the blink of an eye. I was scared out of my wits. I slammed the truck into gear, spun the tires, and got out of there. As I mentioned earlier, it seemed like an eternity. 
but it must have lasted no more than thirty seconds at most. I later returned with an Indian friend of mine whom I grew up with and trusted. He told me some stories that had been passed down through his grandparents' tribe, mentioning something about a loop, Garou, or the French werewolf. He also told me how fur trappers in the late 1700s to the 1800s were chased off the land and the Rockies by this creature. My hunting buddy and I were sitting on a ridge watching for caribou about a thousand yards away, and a large clearing was in view. While we were glassing the clearing for caribou to come out of the brush, we observed a large gray animal walking on hind legs between two large spruce trees on opposite sides of the clearing. We were both long-time Alaskans and avid hunters, having logged many hunts in North America. I have hunted all of North America's deer, elk, black, and grizzly bears, but I had never seen an animal like what we saw that day. We watched it for over half an hour as it moved from one tree across the clearing to the other tree. Eventually, caribou moved into the area, and we lost sight of the animal when it moved off into heavy, thick brush. We had never heard of a Bigfoot in Alaska, but we did tell the bush pilot who picked us up from our hunt that we had seen something strange. He told us that we had probably seen the hairy man, a well-known creature in the region among the native people. First, let me start by saying that this is entirely true. I won't disclose the exact location of the events that took place, but it all happened in the Bald Hills in Washington State. I don't know why they're called the Bald Hills since they aren't really bald. It's filled with forests and woods. The Deschutes River runs through it, and the river was just behind my house, across a field where we generally kept our horses. Around the river was all rocky terrain, and just beyond that lay endless woods. There were very few houses around there, and it was literally in the middle of nowhere. This all happened about nine or ten years ago when I was in fourth grade. Now that's out of the way. Let's get to my story. So the house was occupied by five heads, six including a friend. It was me, my three brothers, my oldest sister, the only one who could drive, and a friend. Our dad was a truck driver, so he was gone for long periods of time, and my mother lost the battle to cancer when I was five years old. We invited our friend to spend the weekend after school, and he brought his PS2, and we were ready to pull all. Nighters on GTA Vice City. Well, something else decided to change our plan. When it got dark, my friend and I decided to go outside and hang out. I was ten or eleven, and he was fourteen. While we were in our yard, we began to hear footsteps in our driveway, which was very odd. Our yard was surrounded by a chain-link fence with two gates at different points of the yard. So, while staying in the yard, we did our best to try and see if we could spot who was here while remaining hidden. We couldn't see anything. It was much too dark. However, we did manage to make out something wandering around in the driveway, it was a fairly large driveway that led up a steep hill. My friend summoned the courage and yelled out to it, stating that it was on private property, which may have been a mistake. The footsteps stopped for a few seconds, then started moving towards us. I looked at my friend's face, and he was in shock. Whoever or whatever was walking around didn't say anything. It just started coming towards us. We bolted inside, speaking faster than our minds could think, telling everyone what was happening. My sister was sleeping at the time, and we didn't want to bother her, but my friend and I were freaking out, and my three brothers were getting concerned as well. So we woke up my sister and told her to call the police. She got annoyed because she thought we were losing it and told us to leave her alone, saying she had work in the morning. Eventually, she gave in and grabbed the dogs. We had five and went outside with a flashlight to take a look around. She put on her rubber boots and jacket and went outside, walking around to prove us wrong that nothing was out there. She walked out of the yard and around the outside of the chain-linked fence. My friend and I waited on the deck, watching her. She walked by an old woodshed where we stored wood, and then it happened. 
A blood-curdling scream came from inside the woods, just behind the woodshed. It sent shivers down my spine and filled me with fear. My sister immediately shined the flashlight into the woodshed. My friend and I ran inside. Cowards, I know. My sister came in a little later, assuming it was just a raccoon and that she didn't see anything else. That put us all at ease, and we went to play GTA. No more than an hour later, we began to hear something outside the house. We all froze again. My sister had gone back to bed, and we didn't want to wake her up again. We paused the game, not making a move. The footsteps made their way onto the deck of the house, and they walked by the sliding glass door, luckily covered with curtains. They weren't steps like shoes or boots. It was more like padding, like feet. My oldest brother suggested that we all go into the basement and hide in his room. We did just that, and we all grabbed a weapon of some kind. Whether it was a baseball bat or a kitchen knife, we all hung out in my oldest brother's room, and I eventually fell asleep. When I woke up, it was morning, and I was very afraid to look outside through the windows, fearing that something might be looking back at me. I finally gathered the courage to look, and there was nothing. Nothing was outside. My brothers, my friend, and I explored outside to see what we could find. We discovered several footprints in the mud, and our picnic table was smashed to pieces. The gates were bent and wouldn't open anymore. My dad had to fix them. We explored the back parts of the woods just behind the house and there. What we saw was a little teep made of sticks. We'd kick it down, and it kept getting rebuilt the next day or two. From that day on, we were very frightened to explore the woods out there. However, one day a few years later, just before we moved, I was outside in the dark alone. The only sound was the rushing river and some wind rustling the large pine trees. I was in the backyard alone, leaning against the chain-linked fence with my flashlight peering into the field behind the house, seeing if I could spot anything interesting, particularly the monster. Then I caught two glares, a pair of eyes from inside the woods. They were focused on me and took several steps forward, out into the clearing and stopped. My flashlight wasn't powerful enough, so all I saw were some eye glares. It was roughly twenty, thirty feet away from me, but it was definitely close enough to startle me. For a long time, I just stood there, shining my flashlight at it as it stared back at me. I was too scared to go up and look at it closely, so over time, I turned around and headed back inside. That was the last time I saw the creature of the bald hills. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.